Welcome to another episode of the Baseball Awakening Podcast, where we dive into the raw, unfiltered, unsexy side of player development. Get ready for some knowledge bombs with your host, Jeff Rottmeyer. Welcome to the Baseball Awakening Podcast. I'm Jeff Rottmeyer. And guys, I'm still dealing with the stuffed up nose, so if I continue to sound weird, you know why. You know, with this show, I want to share something that I learned back in, you know, 2006. You know, it was 2006, you know, when my playing days of the great game of baseball was was done. It was a, a very difficult time. It was a weird time. It hit me harder than I thought it would. And I really didn't know how to cope with it. You know, my life had always revolved around sports, having a routine, having a schedule, and always having to be at places. So it was a late afternoon in 2006, and and I'm sitting at the beach in Fort Myers, Florida, and I'm just looking out into the ocean, and it was so peaceful. The world slowed down for a little while. I had nowhere to be nowhere to go it was weird it was, it was just different I remember sitting there thinking now what you know I didn't finish college I went to I went to college to play baseball so I didn't have a degree I really didn't even know or have a, a, a purpose or understanding of what I needed or wanted to do all I knew was I wanted and I was going to be successful I didn't know what that path was going to look like for me. So a lot of a lot of what was going through my mind, as I was sitting there and reflecting on everything, I was debating on whether I even wanted to give back to the game of baseball or if I wanted to go do some other stuff. And it was a tough decision for me, myself, and I. At the time, I was so frustrated that I didn't reach my potential as a baseball player, or at least in my mind, I didn't. Now here I am. I'm six foot four. I'm 230 pounds. I can hit a baseball 400 feet. I can throw a baseball over 93 miles an hour from the outfield. I ran a six nine sixty, all of which I worked extremely hard at. There was nothing natural. I was the product of hard work. I spent hours and hours in the cage hitting. I would take a bucket of baseballs, head to the open field, and just throw the ball as far as I could, to include weighted balls, which we didn't know much about at that time. And I can go on and on and on, but it was still a very weird time and reflecting on you know, what I did to come up short. But after this little brief time, moment of kind of slowing things down and enjoying the ocean, I got up and I went to the local ball field in Naples, Florida to watch some local kids play. It brought back a lot of memories. And as I sat there, it brought back to me when when the game was fun. You know, it got to the point where, at this point, it got to the point where baseball was kind of my identity, which took the fun away from the game as I knew it. As I was enjoying the scene, I noticed that there was one team that was just so full of energy, and the kids were laughing, and they were having a good time. So I decided to go over there and watch this team. And as I was sitting there watching this team, I couldn't help to notice how well organized the team, their throwing session, the playing catch was so well organized. These kids were 12 years old. It was amazing, and I was sitting there, and it just it it appeared to me that all of these kids had a purpose and, and they understood what they were trying to accomplish with their throwing session. You know, their feet were moving, they were giving each other the target and hit, trying to hit it. Uh, some of the kids looked like they were straddling the blaze the base and placing the tag. You know, the kids were getting super excited about making some of the throws and hitting their target. Uh, they were just having a lot of fun with this throwing program. And, but you can tell that they were working on things. So I watched the team for the rest of the night. And, and the thing that amazes me as I continue to watch them was how well they could catch and throw the ball at 12 years old. 
I remember you talking, you know, I turned and started talking to one of the dads and, and really complimented his son team on how well they catch and throw the ball. And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, man, he goes, this coach is unbelievable. It's weird. You know, he doesn't have a kid on the team and he's from Poland. And he has this throwing program and it's designed to improve one throwing, fielding, catching, and hitting. It's incredible. They're all, they're improving in all areas of the game just by playing catch. And I'm trying to process that. And at the time, it didn't make much sense to me. But as I got into coaching and trying to learn as much as I can about the game, I quickly learned that what this guy was doing was, was brilliant. So whenever this game or practice, I can't remember what it was, it was a game or a practice, when they got done, I went over to the coach and I introduced myself. And his name was Capper. He's the Polish member, the Capper, with his name. I never did get his last name, and that's one thing that I really regret because I would have loved to have reached out to him and tell him thank you for teaching me about your throwing program and the th- and looking at things from a different lens. I didn't always comprehend what he was teaching me at the time, but I, I do now, and, it's, and I really appreciate it. So after some small talk and compliment, uh, Capper... I asked him about his throwing program where, you know, this team who was so full of energy and having fun grabbed my attention instantly. And, and, and Capper, you know, he was, he was beyond thrilled that someone outside of his team even had a slight awareness of how well his team was catching and throwing the ball. And he was so willing and so open to sharing his process he had a bit of an accent, so I, I, it was a little challenging at first for me to make out what he was saying, at least for me. So I didn't really comprehend everything that he was saying. I didn't really write anything down. I, But I remember how detailed it was and how it was a process. He, you know, he, he invited me to a practice, and, and I was still struggling with what I even wanted to do, so I kindly rejected his invitation. And he told me that the invitation was open if I ever wanted to come. And so I'm sitting there one day, and I really I really did not want to go to the practice, but I ended up going. And it was the best decision I ever made when it comes down to what I'm doing now. I didn't know this at the time, but it was. I showed up, I had a pen, I had a notebook, and I was ready to listen and hopefully learn something. And boy, did I learn some stuff. So... Kapler, he started the practice off, and I couldn't help but notice how organized and structured his practices were. You know, it started with a warm up. You know, at the time, you just didn't see much twelve and tw- didn't, you didn't see the type of warm up with twelve and under kids. You know, top notch, a top notch a, a twelve and under can be. And I observed Kapler. And, and and the man he, he just enjoyed coaching these kids and loved what he did. This guy was a volunteer. He didn't have any kids on the team, but he treated every kid like it was his own. You know, he was the second coach that I saw that took the approach, along with my high school coach. The kids loved him, and and, and they were willing to do anything for him. You know, so I took out my notepad and my pen, and I remember on the top. I wrote, if I'm going to coach, that would be the impact I would hope to have on kids that love the game of baseball. Oh, powerful. So after the kids got done warming up, now it's time for their throwing program. And I was really excited about this because this is what interests me. This is what I wanted to learn more about, especially when they said it was going to help you with fielding, catching, hitting, and all this stuff. So... You know, the throwing program goes on for about 30 minutes. And it was amazing to watch. So I asked Packer, how long have you had this team? And how long did it take to get to the point where 12-year-olds can play catch like this? And he said he had the team when they were all about six. And the majority of the team, more than a majority of the team, been together the whole time. He said, look, we train year-round. We're in Florida. We train year-round, and we've been at this thing now for six or seven years. And what he wanted to, you know, he explained to me, he goes, look, he goes, what you're seeing is them playing catch. 
But what you don't see is them working on their throwing, their fielding, the catching, and the hitting ability. And if you didn't know, if you didn't watch closely, you might have almost thought that they were kind of messing around. And and, and that's what Capper reminded me was that they're 12 to let them have fun. You know, so I, I asked him if he would explain to me his process again. Because he did it that very first night I met with him. And how his process help how his program, his process, whatever, helps him improve their throwing, their catching and fielding and hitting ability. And here's what I learned. So starting with the catching, fielding, receiving. So that's the first thing that Capper told me is he referred to the ball coming at you in any fashion is catching the ball. So a ground ball, a fly ball, a ball thrown at you, it doesn't matter. You're catching the ball. So he explained that when they're six years old, his main focus was to get them to catch the ball first. He knew it was going to take some time to get them to throw the ball straight. So he wanted them to, he wanted them to, he wanted to teach them how to catch the ball and move their feet first. So he started this process with, this is when they're six years old. He started this process with a tennis ball and they had, they had no glove. Uh, they'll be on their knees. They're about five to four to five feet away from each other. And they would roll the tennis ball back and forth to each other. And the only instruction that he gave him, gave these kids, was to track the ball all the way into the hand. And then to catch the ball with both hands. The kid would get one point for tracking the ball all the way into the hand. And he would get two points for fielding the ball cleanly. It was interesting. And I asked Capper, I said, wouldn't you think that a six-year-old would know how to catch a ball by now? And again, I'm a young, I'm a young guy. I don't know. I've never worked with a six-year-old before. And he said, sure, maybe. He goes, but it's not enough just to catch the ball. You must use the proper fundamentals to catch the ball. The attention to details matter. And he also said that we have to be aware that they're six. So they're not going to be perfect, but we want the consistency in the movement. That's something that stuck with me to this day, that it's not enough just to be able to make the play. The details matter. I learned that from Capper. So over over time, Capper said, he saw that the kids were making progress with two hands and tracking the ball. All the way into the hand. He would then have them stand up with the baseball glove on. Same process of tracking the ball and seeing the ball on the way in the hand. Now, at this point, we're in a fielding position. So we're hinging at the hips. He's telling them to stick the hip back and learn how to field the ball with both hands tracking the ball all the way in. And he said that as we get better with that, then we'll move to the baseball. But we're, we're going to stick with the tennis ball as long as possible until they get comfortable with the movement, with the process, to be able to use a much harder ball in the baseball. And then from there, it would turn into the underhand toss. So the kids were going to stand about six to eight feet away, and they're going to underhand toss the ball to each other. And they've got to learn to track the ball and catch the ball with two hands. Again, first they'll use the tennis ball, and then they'll use the baseball. And then from there, since at this point, you know, they're they're not really the greatest at throwing and keeping the ball straight. So the coaches would then roll and throw the ball at them. The first the tennis balls, and then the baseball. And the only instruction was to track the ball away into the glove and use both hands. And when they were able to handle the routine play straight at them, the coaches would then roll the ball or throw the ball slightly to the left or slightly to the right. And the only instruction was move your feet, track the ball, and catch the ball. So it's interesting. There was no no, a whole lot of fundamental breakdown. There was the objective that they were trying to do. So... They they got they kept scoring all this stuff. 
You know, so they got they got one point for tracking the ball, they got two points for catching the ball, and they got three points for moving their ball, for moving their feet. So the difficult the task got, the higher points was rewarded. So a process, a, a really cool and successful process that appeared to have been working. And, you know, Capper, he had a, a dad volunteering to help him. And he was more of that analytical uh, numbers guy. So he would help keep track and tally up all the points. And at the end, there would be a winner. You know, and some kids, some kids wanted to win the whole thing. Some just wanted to beat their partner. Some just wanted to beat their own personal record. So it's a pretty cool process to see that everyone's kind of different in what they perceive to be a success for them. So pretty cool. So now as the kids got older and better with the early on process, they progressed into playing catch with one another. So in terms of the receiving end, the, the guy who's catching the ball, the person on the receiving end is going to hold the ball, hold the glove, hold the target in front of their chest. And as they get better and they progress, they're going to start moving the target around to, for, and, and call for different throws. And, and when I say different throws, we're talking about positional specific throws that one would have to make. So like an infielder, you know, turning a double play. Or an outfielder learning to have a long, long hop. You know, Capper makes sure that everyone developed the skill for all positions, whether they play it or not. And what what Capper told me, and this is what he ended up seeing, was by the time these kids were 12 years old, man, they were keeping track of their own score. They were making sure they were catching the ball. They were moving. They were moving their feet. They were tracking the ball. You know, and he talked about, you know, how practice is almost a breeze now. You know, they he worked extremely hard in the beginning to get these guys to do the right thing, and it got easier over time. And I, and I find that to be true, too. And the other thing that he kept stressing over and over and over to me, you know, knowing that I was going to probably be a young coach, was that they were kids. They were going to make mistakes. There are going to be days where you feel like you weren't making any progress, but they are, whether you see it or not. So it, it was brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. All right, so now let's talk about how Capper used his team, uh, had his team throwing and the process that he used with the throwing. So Capper was all about throwing the baseball to a specific location. This was before the velocity dominated the conversation. And I'll add this, you know, Capri was a huge fan of throwing a lot. For for as young as these kids were, they were throwing the baseball a lot. I mean, and at time at that time I didn't really have much of an opinion, but knowing what I know now, what I believe, I believe in throwing a lot as well. And he he explained that though with the throwing process, so he explained that, you know, most six year olds, they are afraid of the ball coming at them especially a harder ball, but even with the tennis ball. So we have to remove the aspect of something coming at them um, when teaching them how to throw. So the whole receiving part, you got to keep them separate so they're not conflicting one with the other. So he would have them throw into a fence. And this was before all the ballparks, you know, regulated what you can or cannot do on the field. You know, so he would line the kids all up in front of the fence and he would take a rope and he would make a circle on the fence in front of the kid. And he and his coaches would go through and put every kid in a position that he wanted them to throw from. And when the kids were all in the right position, the only instruction was, I don't care how you do it, but I want you to hit the, hit that circle from the position that you are in. Pretty cool stuff. So once they got good at it, he would move them back and back and back and eventually transition over to a baseball with the same objective of trying to throw the ball to the target in the position that you are in. And then eventually he would make them get into an infielder's position or an outfielder's position or a catching position and tell them to make the throw from the tar- to the target from the position that they are in. 
And he had everybody do every position. And once they got really good at this, now we are th- now we know how to catch and now we know how to throw. So now it's time to throw to our partner. Your partner is going to stand on the opposite end of you. Their glove's going to be at the chest height. And, the, and your objective is to hit the glove with the baseball. And when they got decent with that, he would have them start moving the glove around and having guys try to hit uh, the target while, while moving around. So, and, and then the process was that they were going out, so this was a long toss. As they were going out, they would try to hit the chest with every single throw. And then as they were coming in, they would make some more, you know, outfield specific throws, you know, the long throw hops and, and, and just straight pull down. But then when they got to about 90 feet, they would start working more on the infielders, arm angle throws, feet work type throws, and, and all that type of stuff. So, again, it was very impressive, you know, again, for a group of 12-year-olds. I mean, they were only 12, but it was very impressive for, for 12-year-olds. So, the, 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 the other thing that he shared with me that I thought was really interesting was he wanted these kids to understand that their eyes need to be set, need to be locked in on a target. A lot of kids will, when they release the ball, their eyes will jump and they will track the ball in, in flight instead of staying locked onto a target. And, and a lot of kids do this. So they just need, they just need awareness of keeping their eye on the target rather than tracking the ball. So pretty cool stuff. So now, the last part, uh, Capper showed, he shared, you know, how playing catch can help a hitter. And he would explain, just like he did earlier, that a kid would be afraid of the ball because they weren't picking up the ball early enough. And so we have to train them to pick the ball up as early as possible, preferably out of the hand. And then that's when he said, you know where else we do that? Hitting. And hitting, when you think about it, you're trying to pick up the ball as early as possible, preferably out of the hand, and track the ball all the way to the bat or the catch glove. Players have a prime opportunity to work on this skill every single time they play catch. That's brilliant. And again, he says, you know, he says it's tough to measure, but he goes, when you work with enough kids and you see enough kids, you'll be able to tell who can see the ball and who can't. Not all the time, but you can tell who's jumping away from the ball and, and who, who who's able to stand in there. They have to be trained how to do this. And this is where he brought up Dr. Bill Harrison. You know, Capper, the one who first introduced me to Dr. Bill Harrison of SlowTheGameDown.com and his work. Uh, brilliant stuff. So, and Capper said, you know, the, the one thing that he has to remind these guys constantly is... It making sure they're picking the ball up out of the hand. It's the one thing that he found that they just haven't, at that time, uh, they just weren't consistently doing. So he would stay on top of them uh, about that. And then the other thing that he said is every time, like he would, he would have a detailed practice plan, and he said every single time I would have a different kid throw to a different kid. Though it wasn't like you had the same throwing partner every time. You had a different one. And the reason why, because he wanted them to learn to pick up the ball out of different release points from different throwers. So it's interesting. You know, the, you know when I was going through the process, it was, it was so overwhelming learning about all of this. But I, but I understand it more now than I, than I did then. You know, and it's really just a simple process. Thinking of it as a process. You know, Capper, he was so efficient with his practice time, and they got a lot done. You know, if I would have stayed in touch with him, I I wonder if he would have been able to take the same approach in the today's instant gratification culture. You know, because what he does is truly a process, and I'm sure he had one for hitting, he had one for pitching, he had one for defense. So... That would be my question if I was ever lucky enough to reconnect with him. You know, but, but, you know, as I reflect on this process that Capper showed me, 
I believe it shaped my approach in having a process for everything that I do with my players. You know, at my academy, I sell a process. And the process works if you work the process. So, I mean, man, I only met up with Capper, you know, three, four, five times that summer. And I regret not doing it more, you know. Had I... Had I just, I, you know, I just got done playing and teaching the game was a lot harder than I thought it was. It was a lot harder than playing. You know, at that time in my life, I didn't know what I wanted to do or think I wanted to even coach. But as I sit here and I talk about this and I reflect on this, you know, I ended up walking away from the game for a little bit. I traveled the world a bit and I worked. But the whole time, I couldn't stop thinking about baseball. And, and and the process that I felt like we could develop. You know, the best decision that I ever made when it came to my coaching career was taking that ride to the local ball field in Naples, Florida, and running into Capper, who shaped my approach when it comes to making everything a process. So I hope this gives you some insights and maybe some insights on how you can improve your throwing program, especially for you younger guys. Thanks for tuning in.